Junoon, Jam se kaam. The oak sleeps in the acorn, the bird waits in the egg, and in the highest vision of the soul, a waking angel stirs. Dreams are the seedlings of realities. Persistence, perfection, patience, power, prioritize your passion. It keeps you sane. As the greatest boxing champion, Muhammad Ali said, it isn't the mountains ahead to climb that wear you out. It's the pebble in your shoe. You can have anything you want if you want it badly enough. You can be anything you want to be and do anything you set out to accomplish if you hold to that desire with singleness of purpose. Passion is energy. Discover that passion and realize the power that comes from focusing on what excites you. For blessed is the man or woman whose true passion can become a profession and then a calling. It is perhaps this spirit of adventure that led Shatbi Basu into an essentially male-dominated domain to become the first ever female bartender in India. As a 21-year-old, Basu wanted to be a Chinese cuisine chef. But Indian restaurants were not particularly happy with women working in professional kitchens at that time. And so, she had to quit her job. Her mother and aunt gifted her a bartender's manual while studying hotel management. The big break happened when she was appointed as a bartender at Mumbai's Chopsticks restaurant, creating beautiful cocktails and mixing drinks behind a bar counter. She endorsed her concoctions onto the menu. She then created STIR, an annual convention that offered seminars and live competitions for students. Her next milestone was in 1997 when she opened a bartending STIR academy. Shat B has designed many bars in India and abroad, including some in Singapore, Lima and New York. She has more than 35 years of experience in the field and has designed several bars, domestic and abroad. Today at Shat B Basu Creative Consultants, she is a bartender, beverage consultant, author, head of a bartending academy and an American whiskey ambassador for India but she feels the best is yet to come. Teaching has been her most rewarding and challenging experience. Ladies and gentlemen, please raise a toast to the doyen of the bar, a lady whose heady cocktails, sometimes shaken, often stirred, have raised bartending to a fine art in this segment of Anant Drishti, Junoon Jam Se Kaam.
even though I may not have understood it when I began my journey, when I look back, I think the word Anand Drishti um, applies pretty much uh, to what happened along the way. And I think even today, I think if I had to look forward, um, there is so much that we have achieved and so much that we have been able to change. And I think in the way that we are today, we will continue working towards those goals. Now I know that you saw some stuff that I do on the screen there, and a lot of my public life uh, revolves around being a bartender, uh, working with spirits, um, creating stuff for people, but that's um, something I've learned along the way. It was not something I had a plan with. I began my journey wanting to be a vet, uh, wanting to um, heal animals, because I was really, uh, you know, bringing in every stray little thing that I could find at home. Till my mom used to kind of really, really say, oh my God, seriously, yet another one? But, and so I studied science. I had a really a lot of trouble with mathematics, but I kind of persevered because that was it, right? If you don't study science and if you don't do your 12th with science, you can't get admission into vet school. Anyway, all that happened, I got into vet school and just when I was about to start my term, my family doctor figured that I had joined vet school and he told my parents that I couldn't do that because I suffered from allergies. And that I would probably spend more time in the hospital than the animals. So suddenly there was this cross put saying, oh my God, the doctors, there's no way you can become a vet. I had no plan B because my entire growing up was focused only on that one plan. And then my mom said, that well, she's the only one who helps in the kitchen, so maybe she should go to the Institute of Hotel Management. She'll probably do well there. I didn't have a plan B, so I just went along with them. And um, after being completely confused for the first six months, I kind of fell into it. Um, the next step was, okay, I figured that now I want to be a chef. So I worked for two and a half years, working really hard, wanting to be a chef. Um, I even started working in the kitchen as a training chef, um, wanting to be a specialist in Asian cuisine. But 10 months later, I realized that when you work in a hotel, they only put you where they need you, and they're not too concerned about what you want to do. And so after trying really hard to get them to put me into the Asian kitchen, when that didn't happen, I kind of quit, and I said, well, I've wasted so long, I'm not going to waste a minute more. Maybe I'll just go work with an Asian restaurant. But unfortunately, the Asian restaurant's chef didn't want me in his kitchen either. I was simply pushed into looking after the restaurant. And as part of my job, I was to handle the bar as well. I knew nothing about the bar. I mean, well, I knew my basics, but I had no technique. I didn't understand how it is that I should make drinks. And so I started studying. And while studying and making drinks and realizing that we had very little to work with and I had to start getting seriously innovative and adapt, I fell in love with that whole process and I realized that it was so much better than the kitchen because I was actually able to make things, discover things, um, create the drinks and then actually watch as I gave them and presented them to the customer and could actually tell from their faces whether I had done a good job or not. And if I hadn't done a good job, I had the ability to go back and change it. Alongside that, I realized that as I learned, I shared. And as I grew into it and as I studied even more and more, because that was me, I had to be really, really good at something that I did. Otherwise, it was just not worth it. So in spite of the fact that, well, we didn't really have too much, there was obviously no technology. Uh, there were only books, and I would walk around Bombay, around the streets at Fort, trying to find as many books as I could that would be able to teach me. And this is how I really learned. I learned from people who came, who visited, who I could talk with, and from books. And while I did that, I also shared it with everyone who worked with me. Because I realized that you on your own can't
can't really achieve anything. You have to build a team with you. And unless the people who are with you and around you learn alongside with you, you really don't achieve very much. And that is something that bartending taught me. And then when I really, really look back, I think almost everything that I am today, the person who I have become is because of that one skill that I decided to perfect, and that was bartending. Now, a lot of you might be surprised. How is it that bartending can teach you so much? Because a lot of people think bartending, or working with a bar, or working with spirits uh, in the atmosphere that we live in, is a no-no. It's taboo. And only bad people work with alcohol. Um, and women in alcohol, oh my god, you already have an answer there, that if women work with alcohol, oops, there must be something wrong somewhere. But I think it's only because uh, of ignorance. It's, it's because people don't know, uh, are not exposed to it too much. And of course, uh, in, in the early stages, I, I blamed uh, not just uh, the people who govern us, but also media who would blow it out of proportion. Uh, who would think and who would take kind of one incident that happened somewhere and blow it uh, so much out of proportion that they would think that everyone who worked in the industry must face that. And in fact, after, um, well, I've spent almost four decades working in the industry that I am in. Four decades is a really long time. And yet I find even today after four decades, there are still people from the media who ask me simple questions. They're not really simple. I think they're silly. Because they ask me a question like, are you safe in a bar? Do you feel safe? Do you think a bar for a woman is a safe place to be in? Don't you think you might get attacked? Or don't you think people will you know, look down upon you? I mean, that's the strangest thing I've ever heard. Because honestly, working behind the bar is probably the safest place a woman can actually be in. It is. I think women who can work behind the bar are safer than women at home, safer than women on the street, safer than women in trains, safer than women almost anywhere. The thing is, they only question us. They don't question other women in the hospitality industry. They don't question women who work in front of us. The ones they should question the most, because they are the ones at most are women who work in housekeeping. They're never asked this question. They only ask people like us who work behind the bar. So, and, and this is especially true, even women journalists ask me, and my, my rebuttal to that is very simple. How many of you feel safe going out to a bar and having a drink, sitting there in a bar and having a drink? Going and sitting at a table and ordering a drink? Most people say they're really comfortable and they're not unsafe at all. And I'm saying, if you're sitting in an actually potentially unsafe zone, which is outside in the seated area, in a bar or in a club that's really crowded, do you have control when it's crowded about who might actually touch you or grope you? You don't. But think about me. I stand behind a bar counter. I have a whole bar counter. And that is a barrier between me and anyone on the other side of the bar. Can anyone touch me? No. And then I have bartenders on either side of me, and trust me, they're better than bouncers. <laughs> We're the safest in the world. And the best part is when you see a woman behind the bar counter who looks confident that she knows her stuff, women in the audience, they're the ones who feel the most comfortable in that bar. They're the ones who feel that they can come up to you, talk to you, and actually, um, you know, have an absolute conversation and ask you questions. And we make them feel safe. We make them feel that it's okay to hang in a bar and there's nothing wrong with it. And honestly, we really work in good bars. It's some of our people on top who don't know the difference and have a single excise policy for all bars. They don't know the difference between our kind of bars and the kind of bars you really don't want to go to. And yet, so many do. So, working in a bar taught me how to be patient. Because when you're under stress, when you're pushed 
with 500 people outside and you have to make drinks all the time, you learn that the only way you can do it is to stay calm. Sometimes you're working in a bar and the tap just broke open. No one knows except you. So I'm standing and my feet are actually submerged in water. Nobody knows it except me. And yet you keep working. You keep trying to fix the problem and go there. Sometimes you're in a bar where the glasses have gone out and they haven't come back. Now you have orders, but you have no glasses. And you try and find, you know, find innovative ways of trying to keep the people around you calm so that you can get your job done. It taught me patience. It taught me how to teach. Teaching is a very difficult job. I feel that you can either lecture or you can actually teach. Um, it took me back to when I was in college when I went through all these lectures. And there are so many times, there were only lectures. There were no teachers. They were only lecturers. They didn't care that you didn't understand. They didn't even know that you didn't understand. And they didn't even know that you weren't absorbing anything that was said to you. But working in a bar taught me the difference between lecturing and teaching. Teaching is when you find a connection to the people who are listening to you, connecting with their minds, and then making sure that you reach them. And that's the only way you're going to reach them, not assuming that they should know before you actually teach. It's not about me telling everyone how much I know, but on the other hand, being able to reach out and convey to them in the language that they understand and making sure that they absorb the knowledge that I want to give them. It taught me geography and history because everything that we work with comes from agriculture. The grain that is used to make the spirits comes from agriculture. The flavors that we use come from fruit, flowers, and all of that comes from geography. What the classroom couldn't teach me, um, and I was never able to remember when I was in school, which crop grew where, because they taught us all of that in isolation. They never made the connection between the culture, the people, and the land. They simply said, rice grows here, wheat grows here, barley grows here, potatoes grow here, but why they didn't say it? Bartending taught me geography because it said that barley is used to make beer and whiskey in Scotland, Ireland and Wales. Why? Because that's what grows there and that's the excess of the land and not what they use for their mainstream food. Therefore, they do not make anything with wheat. Russia, on the other hand, uh, on the other hand started with potato but shifted to wheat because at some stage in their geographical and agricultural pattern, they found that they could grow wheat twice in a year. So they had summer and they had winter wheat. And that became the excess of the land and they realized that, well, potatoes have so much water, which means with a kilo of potato, I'll get only that much alcohol. But if I use a kilo of wheat, I'll get far more. So they switched. So they make their vodka from wheat. But the Polish don't make it from wheat, they make their vodka from rye. Whereas the Americans make it from corn. I would never have learned that in school. No way. It taught me history. Because for almost everything that we did, there was some history involved. I never understood years when I was in college and school. I always made mistakes when I had to say what happened in 1932 or what happened in 1857. I couldn't figure it out. There was a time when I made this huge mistake. I even mixed up the centuries because no one ever told me in succession what a century actually meant. And I thought 19 something or 18 something meant the 18th century. And you can imagine how terrible I felt and I was so embarrassed when I realized what a huge mistake I had made. But it was bartending that taught me about um, what happened during the various prohibitions in the various countries. What 
all the different, um, uh, what, what happened at turns of century, what happened um, during the wars, what happened at some of the battlefields, and because some of the greatest cocktails were created during those era. It was also um, on how, when prohibition was repealed in the United States, um, it was crazy. It was repealed with a glass and a martini, the cocktail, and that's how I remember um, history as well. So not only does it teach you to be a good person, uh, to be someone who builds a team, who shares knowledge, who kind of learns to deep breathe and be patient, um, it teaches you so much more. And I think who I am today is because of the fact that I stood behind the bar and I met so many people. I learned to communicate with so many people, learned to understand them. Um, sometimes I feel that I should have, you know, studied psychology and psychiatry because a lot of what we do behind the bar is even that. We learn to analyze people who walk in. As they're walking in towards you, you're looking at them, um, you're watching what they're wearing, you're looking at their face, you're, you're figuring out who they're with to be able to understand the kind of person they are and what is it that you should do to offer them. And all of that comes simply from observation and communication. Today we're trying to be more sustainable in the bar as well. We're trying to make sure that we do not waste too much. We're trying to make use of the fruit in entirety. We are learning techniques like dehydration uh, so that we don't waste anything. And when it comes to the subject of waste, it's another thing that I have often thought about and we have, as a community, discussed it a lot. There is so much waste in our country, whether it's fruit or vegetable or grain. There is a lot of waste in the country. And a lot of it is because of the fact that we don't have sufficient storage facilities or good quality storage facilities. Now, it may seem strange to you, but there is a way, when you do not have the facility, you can actually change that by, well, distilling the leftover waste fruit, turning it into alcohol. And it doesn't have to be portable alcohol, it can actually be alcohol that we use for medicine, alcohol that we use to create things for the hospital. Um, it would be actually free almost, because most of that fruit is going waste. So let me conclude by saying that I started off wanting to, eat, uh, to heal animals. I ended up healing another kind of animal, the homo sapiens. <laughs> and I started by studying the spirit in my glass. And it taught me to understand the spirituality within me and to learn that life and spirituality and the way we are does not only come from lessons that you hear, but it comes from lessons that we learn in life and we share and we absorb while we are there and then make sure that we use them to advantage and use them to share with the rest of the world and to make sure that we are there to help people who are less deserving and those who we can help to make a career of their own so that they can support their families. And I think a lot of the teaching that we've done is that, giving young people somewhere to look forward to and make sure that they have a career and they can support their families. Um, otherwise, they would never be able to. Thanks so much for being patient. Thank you. If you never venture out of the pond, you'll never know there's an ocean. The Rotary Excellence Award is conferred upon Chatpi Basu for her stirred and shaken passion in concocting.